And we're back for round number two in one day. Uh, welcome back to the show. This is PT Pinecast, a podcast that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories in the world of physical therapy. I'm Jimmy McKay. I'll be your host, broadcasting live today from the Arius Medical Studios also known as my bedroom. Uh, find them at aureusmedical.com. That is aureusmedical.com. Uh, aureusmedical.com. I love the fact that it's live. I can't edit that out. We'll just go with it. Uh, leaders in hashtag travel physical therapy. If you're looking to travel about the country and treat patients geographically where you want to and setting where you want to, check out what Arias has to offer. aureusmedical.com. Go there. Uh, great show for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking about Really, like, uh, really insight, things that are maybe like a barrier to learning. I'm wondering where our guest was today when I was struggling through PT school, trying to figure out how to navigate that. I'm guessing laying on a book is probably not a solution she's going to be giving you tonight in terms of how to get the information in your head. Probably not one of those. Spoiler alert, doesn't work. Uh, we want to make sure you drop us a comment or a question. Let us know where you're at. That's below if you're watching the live stream or the replay. Let us know you're uh, watching the replay by dropping replay in there. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and now again doing those uh, live streams. Check out all the shows available on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at PT Pinecast on the socials. Let's bring in our guest today. Physical therapy educator with a passion for learning science, all things pediatrics, and diversity, equity, and inclusion in the PT profession. Let's welcome to the program, Mika Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I felt it. Motivated. I'm, I felt I it. I walk around the house, and at any moment where I'm like feeling down, I'm just like, you know what? Oh, you know, oh, thank, oh, please, yes. not, you know, just, you, it's you oh, too much. round of applause. <laughs> uh, Mika, welcome to the show. How are we doing today? We are doing great. Thank you for having me. Where are you geographically? Where are you located? I am located in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Ooh, rub it in. I love like that North Carolina, South Carolina area. Um, yes. I, people are like, you know, it gets really hot down there. I'm like, don't threaten me with a good time. I love <laughs> it hot like that. Like I lived in South Carolina for two years and I would go running in July at noon on a sunny day. Because my thing is, if it's time to get sweaty, like let's just get really sweaty and just get rid of it. Let's go all in. But yeah, there is part of it where it's like, well, I walked outside to the car and it was instantly bathed in sweat. I'm like, but you know what? It's better than snow. It's always better than snow. That is very true. Uh, Miko, uh, t tell the audience about you. Like, what's, what's your superhero backstory in the, uh, the professional physical therapy? I am originally from New York. Where? Where in New York? Grew up in Brooklyn and Long Island. All right. Okay. And then came to North Carolina for college and never went back. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and you're in the world of pediatrics. That's kind of your jam. If people follow Mika on uh, on Twitter, as we have her profile there on the screen at M Mitchell PCS, uh, talking a lot about pediatric physical therapy. Was that what you did right out of at, at a PT school? Did you know were you one of those who was like, I know exactly what I'm going to do. It's this, and then you went that way, or were you like the rest of us where we were going to go one way and we hit a hard right turn somewhere else? I did not know I was going to be so interested in pediatrics going into PT school. I think every class it was, oh yeah, I could do that. Oh yeah, I could do that too. And then it was our pediatric class and that was it. I was like, wait, we can play with kids all, all day. day? All day. And I enjoy children. I think I found my thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, and then after that, it was... It's all down. It. That's your thing. And once you go, once you get, once they get their hooks in you and they start looking at you with those eyes, it's like, how am I going to say no? Uh, our first round brought to you by our friends from Owens Recovery Science. They're a single source for PTs looking for uh, certification and personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training, BFR, as the cool kids are calling it these days. Uh, check out more at owensrecoveryscience.com. Had Johnny Owens and Kyle Kimbrell on from Owens Recovery Science not long ago, and they were actually talking about the implications of BFR in pediatric uh, physical therapy and geriatric PT. And I thought, you know, we kind of had like part of the discussion, which is like, hey, this started in the tactical athlete, you know, limb salvage, military, heavy military based. And then it went to sports, which I think is like kind of that progression, like, ooh, what are they doing? Can it give me an edge? Mm -hmm. Now, BFR has been is, is beginning to be implemented in research anyway, in pediatric and geriatric uh, populations. 
very exciting to see where they're going to go. They're obviously going to research it very, very carefully because you need to do this very, very carefully. We talk about this all the time. They've got the equipment to do it properly because mm -hmm. uh, the FDA considers a tourniquet uh, a medical device that yeah. you're including. You, watch out. you want to you want to make sure you're doing uh, you're doing it right. So uh, Johnny Owens and the team bringing that to the pediatric world, which is uh, pretty exciting. So check them out. Owens Recovery Science. Dot com. Uh, Mika, you're, uh, you're a, P, uh, a PT educator as well. Tell everybody who you get to talk with and educate. Yes, I am a professor at Methodist University in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which happens to be my alma mater for my undergraduate degree. So my heart is just so full for all things Methodist University. What is the mascot of Methodist? I don't I'm usually very good at mascots. Ooh, I cannot think of Methodist. It's a monarch. It's a lion. Monarch. Well and done. And we're green and gold. I knew the colors. I knew it was green and gold. <laughs> picture. Um, so, so that's got to be pretty, pretty fulfilling in terms of being able to treat kids, work in pediatric physical therapy, also uh, educate kids, as I like to call them, going through PT school. And I'm pretty sure after a couple of years after PT school, when you graduate, you feel like everybody's a kid. Um, and, uh, and and that's something that excites you in terms of how to get people to grab onto information and acquire knowledge. And you lead off uh, off by saying our intuition is most likely ineffective in acquiring knowledge. And I mentioned in the intro to your show, probably sleeping on a book or, I, you know, sometimes I would put the book on my head to try to get that whole osmosis thing. Not the best strategy. But why is our intuition most likely ineffective when we're trying to acquire knowledge in such a short time like PT school? I think it's ineffective because we want to choose what's easy. Even though studying is not easy, we would perceive that if I do what I've always done, I can learn this. And a lot of times what happens is we've crammed to this point before, you know, getting to graduate level studies and putting in a little bit different work and trying to change the, the strategy of how we study has been shown more effective. So for me, and I would say I'm guilty of it as well. In PT school, it took me a while to figure it out. And so my passion with the learning sciences, let me teach you, let me show you this sooner so you don't even have to try to unlearn some of the bad habits that you've already yeah. established. And so, you know, how many of us love a highlighter? Yeah, yeah. You yep. know, okay. multiple color pens and underlining and- I, mean, I highlight <laughs> everything, which is actually like unhighlighting like two words, which is which is probably why you're saying it's ineffective. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, I've been guilty of the transcribing. I'm going to read my book and I'm going to read it and write at the same time. So I'm reading and writing and reading and writing, but never putting the demand on your knowledge up front because that's painful. That's sure. the hard part sure. where you you ask yourself a question and you're like, oh, I don't know the answer. I don't like how that feels. I don't want to do that again. I'll just pretend like, you know, that illusion of knowledge. I'll pretend that I'm I'm studying effectively because I can see the answer. And oh, yeah, I've seen that. Oh, yeah, I know that answer. Until you take your test and then you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, because um, a good test is going to highlight what you don't know. A good test. Yes. Yeah. And hey. I think... Um, well, I was going to say, you you mentioned a second ago, um, doing what you've always done and then doing it in grad school, it just brings a, you know, a quote to me, which is, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. So we should be smart enough to go, okay, if I keep doing what I've always done, I'm never going to improve at all. And we don't realize how harmful cramming can be because you've been successful you know, yeah. to this point in high school and in undergrad, but the knowledge that we're learning in PT school you need all of that foundational knowledge and you need to retain it. So it's not like the first test you take in anatomy, I can just cram it, pump and dump it. I don't need it again. You're going to need that forever. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I was taught this early in PT school from my professor, Sky Donovan, who was just uh, chiming in the last episode we had. And she would write these questions and I'd say, man, your questions are like inception. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, they're like questions in questions in questions, like three dream levels down. And she's like, well, when you're in clinic or when you're taking the MPTE, they're not going to say, you know, what's the muscle that's uh, or originates here and inserts here. They're going to put it in context and you've got to be able to to learn to answer questions like that. And you've got people chiming in right now. Cookie Friedhoff Bowman, who, by the way, the little PT Pinecast history was episode number one. Uh, Cookie chiming in saying, yeah, sadly, the public education system doesn't teach kids how to study. 
something her sixth grade teacher uh, uh, taught her. But, you know, I, I forget where I watched it to give it credit, but um, the current public, you know, great, you know, grade school through high school education system was really born about the assembly line and how to get people to know how to do something over and over and over again. So we can, so we can process things quickly. And, uh, we know that's not a great way to do it in higher education. So if we lead with our intuition is most likely ineffective in acquiring knowledge, Mika, what do we do about it? So now it's an opportunity to learn some new strategies and you have to one, first of all, have a growth mindset, understanding that you have the capability to learn more, to learn deeper, to learn different things, no matter how old you are. We learn that in physical therapy with neuroplasticity, like there is that potential for growth and for learning. And so looking at the evidence and um, I've dived into lots of books and um, websites and, and authors, research authors that look into these effective ways of studying. And so I don't want to take up all the time, but I really want to talk about one particular, and it is retrieval practice okay. and how you don't want to surprise yourself at the test about what you don't know. You want to be testing yourself along the way. Right. We might have just lost Mika. Might be having an internet sh issue right there. We'll see if we can get her back. Uh, and we'll finish this up uh, while we're taking a break. Do you want to uh, let pe people know that we're going to have a, a contest from the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy, uh, a sponsor of the show? Going to have an opportunity for you guys to pick up uh, another one of their uh, monographs. They've got all these uh, educational sets. So if you're looking to up your uh, Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy game, why not do it from the, uh, the Academy of Orthopedic PT? Check them at orthopt.org. As we bring back in Mika, well, that might have been an internet connection or something like that. You're back. She's back, though, everybody. Where did I pause? I apologize. Oh, no, so that. screen froze. It's technical uh, technology. It, it's great until it doesn't work. You were really talking about quizzing yourself along the way, which, as you mentioned at the top of the show, I had students a year above me hand down quizzes, and I would take them, and I felt icky if I didn't know the answers, which is why I avoided them. But that's a, a reason. Is what you're saying is why I. Should have, should not have avoided them. I should have gone that way. So that's a more effective route in 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 the in the in the active process of learning is what you're saying in terms of evidence based. Yes, and looking at the combination of that, what we call I call it's called retrieval practice. So really, just putting a demand on that knowledge, and you can practice writing your notes out. You know, if you have a topic that you're studying, instead of reading everything that you've read before, because you have that illusion of knowledge, you just take a blank piece of paper and write everything you know about that topic. Just go. And then where you stop, you go back to the book, review your notes and see what you were missing. And then from there, you identify what was, like, what is it about what I was missing? That is it, I didn't understand it. Is that, that I just didn't give it enough time for it to, you know, to stick and solidify my, my knowledge base. And so just going through that process, it gives you that understanding of, okay, I've got this topic. And then once you have a topic, because it's comfortable, we're not going to stay there. Right. We're going to say, okay, I do know this. It's not an illusion. I can explain it. And now I'm going to study something else. Yeah, you talk about a lot of things. I love when people put words to things that I'm like, I knew that, but I didn't know how to put it to words. And you're talking about, I love that phrase, the illusion of knowledge. It's like, do you know this? You're like, yeah, I know this. And then you kind of have this like, mm, yeah, I know this. What are you, how, how are you going to test me? And it really is that, I mean, it's a, it's a great PT analogy, which is we get injured in the directions that we don't strengthen or, or we have poor range of motion, right? I'm a runner and a cyclist and a swimmer. I go, f I'm real good at going forward. Um, and when do I get injured? I get injured when I go sideways. So which way do I need to go? I need to go sideways a lot uh, in my training. Um, but if we constantly review topics and areas that we're really comfortable with, and I found myself doing this when I was ironically at the end of PT school studying for the NPTE, I'd review stuff that I felt because well, it's a reward, right? Mm -hmm. I know this. I'm going to get this right. But but hey Jimmy, what if what if they literally ask you anything else? Well, I'll just right. deal, I'll deal with that when I'm when I'm comfortable. Um, and you don't want that to happen on the test or in the clinic or on the NPTE. Exactly. You want to make sure you can do that before that. So uh, I love that. What what do you what do you recommend? Is it is it quizzes along the way that you design yourself? I know a lot of people used to use 
um, Quizlets and stuff like that. They used to use, you know, quiz designed by other people. Because if I'm designing my quiz, I kind of already know the answers and I kind of make it myself. We used to switch quizzes with kind of study groups sometimes. What else do you recommend for students in terms of using these evidence-based strategies to maximize that learning? I think those are great examples. Definitely, you know, don't rely on your own questions because yeah, yeah. you'll you'll know the answers. Yeah. But um, there is there are endless opportunities for just coming up with creative ways for retrieval practice. And it really, I, I started learning about these learning strategies before I started teaching, but it really stuck home once I had to teach content. Because, and so this is a way to actually do retrieval practice. Another method is teaching somebody, explaining the concept to somebody else and somebody that doesn't necessarily know what you're talking about as well as somebody that knows what you're talking about. So that way you can see where you're stumbling over your words and where you might need to go back to the basic definitions of all the things that you're saying. You know, like if we're yeah. trying to explain a topic and we're using bigger words, but can you break down every word because that person that you're talking to may ask a question. And, and then you also show how much you understand about it. And so just really preparing yourself as if you were gonna teach the content. And it, it's great for physical therapists because we can apply this in any part of our career. So before coming to PT school, as a PT student, as a resident, as a fellow, as a PT, because you're always doing education in some capacity. And the more you can explain it to your patients, the more you have buy-in. So as a, as a therapist, you know, that retrieval practice, you're practicing your, your, your um, script. How are you going to explain this to this patient? How do you explain their disease process to get their buy-in so that they will really participate in your intervention? Or, you know, if you're trying to get them to do something different that they've never heard of before, if you're not going to explain it well, you're probably not going to get that buy-in. And then it's just like, okay, well, they they didn't want to participate. You got to sell it, you know? You have to tell them, like, this is why. And I tell my students all the time, don't, you know, embrace the why questions. Like, why? Why? let me tell you why you know like i <laughs> and the more you study and the more you learn and the more you understand your craft then you can just tell tell you know tell all about it <laughs> yeah. cookie cookie dropping a lot in the hair she says she loves it see one do one teach one i was literally going to say the exact same thing cookie and i are literally right here um by all means see one you know just be just be an observer and just and just kind of take that in and absorb and allow that okay but then know that you're going to have to now do it and then eventually you're gonna have to teach it. So you start to formulate that teach it yeah. while you're seeing and you get to kind of go through it either kinesthetically or verbally when you're doing and then it's time to teach it. And then you go back to Einstein, right? He would say like, if you don't know how to explain something simply, you don't understand something. I love quotes like that. Um, and, uh, and you're right in PT. Uh, and from my background in radio, I would tell people all the time, if you're not, if you don't know how it, you're going to explain this to me now while we're in my office away from the radio studio, how you're going to say it on the air when that light comes on and you know that mic is live and there's a hundred thousand people listening. You're trust me, the, the, even the most savvy veterans in broadcasting will freeze. Um, you better practice that. And getting this goes back to getting comfortable being uncomfortable because someone's going to ask you a tough question. Let's practice the how you're going to answer those tough questions now or by yourself or with a group, someone who knows exactly, I love what you said that, with someone who has no idea what you're talking about, that's a safe environment. Like, yeah, that sounds kind of good. Or, But they can give you good feedback in terms of, I don't really, I understand what you said, but you kind of like, your pitch wasn't direct. And then you get someone who really knows what they're talking about. Like, okay, here's where you kind of fell short. So using those strategies is uh, is definitely probably good to do before the NPTE because that's really when I started to hone on hone in on those. I probably should have been putting those into into play well before my third year in uh, in PT school. Um, but this this brings up to our our second point I wanted to, you to talk about, which is mindset and commitment can make change. I feel like mindset and commitment has to go with, hey. I want to just go cram because I've been very comfortable cramming and it's been very good to me. But if you want to make change, you got to make, you got to, you got to have it in your head. You got to say it out loud. You got to make a commitment. That's only when change can occur. Absolutely. And it just goes back to that growth mindset, being open to the possibilities um, and, and giving yourself permission to understand that we're not perfect. You know, I think, 
PT professionals. We come into this profession. We have had great grades. We are competitive. You know, it's all about knowing all the things and doing everything well and just being okay with, I'm not going to get everything. I'm, I don't know it all, but I have the capacity to continue to learn. Right. And with the foundation and with the understanding of um, that there's more to acquire, I can continue to move forward. I don't have to say, well, you know, these people in my class, I barely got into school. Nobody knows that, but you know, sometimes that imposter syndrome kind of yeah. settles in. And so it's like, no, give yourself the credit. You made it to PT school. You are, you belong here. You have the capacity to continue minute. to learn. And so taking that and just grinding, you know, that commitment is, now I know that there are more effective ways to study. I have to hold myself accountable, maybe your study partners or you know whoever it is that, that you check in with, holding yourself accountable and being committed to take one thing. Because you know, I talk to our students about a lot of different study strategies and it's, maybe it can be overwhelming to think of like, I have to change everything right now, but you can change one thing. You know, take the thing that you're most comfortable with and say, OK, if I love the highlight, like I have I just went to the store and I bought all the highlighters in every color. I will say you can still highlight, but let's try to be more effective with it. You know, maybe use it to doodle around the paper, but not to highlight all the words in the book. Um, and just really know that there are ways to focus your attention when it's time to study. We're turning off notifications. We are, uh, you know, taking the apps that you're, you automatically go to on your phone <laughs> that you don't even realize, like, how did I even get here? Right. Uh, you know, and taking those distractions and hold, you know, the people around you, letting them know, okay, this is the time. Like, if I come out of this space for studying, don't it, don't pay any attention to me because I still have more time. You know, or setting time time boundaries and um, accountability for yourself. And those little steps will continue to kind of flex your muscles of learning and and you're, you'll see the effectiveness and then you're like, okay, well, I can do more. Okay, so what's next? Yeah, so two things. One, what is it about the highlighting? Because as the more you say it, the more I realize like, it just felt, it was like, I at least I at least touched the word, right? So like later on, I'll go, I touched it. I touched all the words, I touched all the words. But I really didn't learn, right? Just touching them does not do anything. It's just like, you know, laying with the book on my head. It's, they're, they're both doing it, nothing. So is, is that just a, is that my whoopee? Is that my comfort blanket of touching all the words with a marker? Look, I uh, yeah. it up. Yeah, and maybe it's that fault, the sense of maybe you think it's their kinesthetic versus you actually picking up the pen and writing the words without seeing them. Right. You know, so if you feel the comfort in holding the highlighter, you know, you could possibly write with a highlighter, but you know, if you felt like the highlighter was your thing, but you know, just really identifying that that's part of, you know, the metacognition, how we think about thinking, sit back and say, why do I do the things that I do? Is this going to be effective or has it been effective? Or if you identify, you know, if you're in PT school or you're studying for PCS or you're studying for MPT and you've taken practice tests and you hit a block and you're like, wow, I thought I knew these things. And then I realize I don't, then you have to make like you have to be willing to make a quick change to continue. Yeah. And be successful. The second point you just brought up a, a, a few seconds ago was turning off the apps that we go to. And this was great advice that I got from several professors in PT school, really around the NPTE. And they said, listen, if you're taking a practice test, you're gonna have the impulse to say, I'm pretty sure I know this. Let me Google it to find out real quick in the middle of a practice test. But what they told me was getting it wrong on a practice test is a win. Do that. Take By all means, take your best shot. But to make sure that you don't just default to, let me just do like a new tab real quick here on the side because obviously there are no tabs on the NPTE, but that can, that can lead you, I'm guessing, into a false sense of security of like, I'm pretty sure I knew that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Because you might have guessed it right. So by all means, get it wrong and don't, you're saying resist that urge in terms of looking it up. That's got to be big. Absolutely. Um, and you just want to hold yourself accountable because the high stake is the test. Yeah. And so if you practice any test taking, you know, if you know, 
if you have test anxiety, if you get nervous, maybe being in the type of space or understanding what that environment is going to be like, but simulating what that test is going to be. If you have two hours to take a test, practice studying for two hours. If it's the MPT, you need to practice. And for the weekend, set yourself in a place where you have that. What, how long is the test? Like Seven? four hours. Is it four? four? Okay. Yeah. So you have your MPT, then you have your um, your certified specialist exams. And so those are longer. Um, and so really to build your endurance for that, you probably need to consider um, practicing studying and practicing test taking in the, that same environment. So that way you ha you ha know what to expect and it helps you to be more su um, more successful. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing the test, knowing the layout and actually putting yourself in that environment. Would you ever work with a patient who was going to run a half marathon and only have them run six miles? No, of course not. You would have them build up to something close uh, to, to the actual uh, you know race day. And I, I, I lucked out. I got a similar advice, which was, no, 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 not, not in your room because your room is this really comfortable environment. I want you to go to the library and get one of those private study rooms and lock yourself in there. And no, you can't take two bathroom breaks. You can only take one. So prepare for these things because if if you're awkward on on race day on NPTE day, um, you know these things. You know, as as Matt here points out, endurance is key. Hi, you know, Matt. I work with him. Tell people all the time, like this is mental endurance. I mean, I think we 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 say we we average like a minute or a minute and a couple seconds uh, per question on the NPTE. So by all means, if you get a question, you're like, I got this right away in ten seconds. Realize you're going to use some of that time you can bank some of that time to move to the next one but realize when you get one of those schedule breaks hey your brain uh i know it's not a muscle but you should treat it as this mental endurance of maybe taking a break and taking a couple maybe take five really really deep breaths because this thing is gonna is gonna go deep uh lots of people saying saying hi matt saying hi Lori saying hi uh drop questions for mika below in the uh, comment section if you're watching live on facebook or uh, or on twitter hi, Lori. Uh, we're really talking about uh, study study and really learning i know we're, we're bringing up a lot of studying because you were you're, you're a professor at a pt program but this probably continues on to we're lifelong learners mika I've heard, that, I heard that all through pt school and i was like man this is i thought it was going to end eventually uh but being yeah. lifelong learners uh mindset and commitment afterwards you went ahead and said i'm gonna i'm gonna get my specialty examination and i'm guessing these strategies helped you to do that because those tests are even more intense in a specific area um if someone's not necessarily going through a, a specialty exam or the npte and pt school these things have to be just great life skills to have. Absolutely, because we're always learning something and we're always sharing. And if we are, you know, as this lifelong learner in our profession, the evidence is changing. So we're always having to maybe unlearn some things and, you know, learn some new things. Um, how, how it was done when I graduated is not the same. And so being open to that and being able to dive into the research and the evidence with this capacity to say, okay, this is something new. I seen, you know, I saw this on the journal. I saw some people tweeting about it because Med Twitter and PT Twitter is it keeps us abreast of um, current right. events and knowledge. And so, just really, if there's something you want to learn in life, you know, we think about our hobbies. A lot of times we focus just on PT, but we do have lives outside of that. And so, it's it's applicable for ourselves as well as for our children. Right. And this isn't I think or I feel. This is Mika doing research uh, into this, which she was uh, beginning to teach. Samantha saying hi. She's giving a wave. Um, where do you find this research? Where is this an educational? Is this higher education research? Where do you look for these types of things when you're looking for strategies to give to students or to adopt yourself? Where do you seek these out? So I found uh, there are some books and some websites that I have um, really per perused. So there is The Learning Scientist's. And that website has lots of resources. They have podcasts, they have um, uh, like infographics to kind of help with understanding the different terms that they go into. And so at various levels, we can look at multiple strategies. So not just the retrieval practice, there's other ways to solidify your knowledge and make sure that you are uh, effective in your studying. So when it actually comes to sitting down and learning the material, do you spend five hours on one topic? but the research shows that you need to break that up. So yeah. 25 minutes, you cool. know, we talked, you, you brought it up and how you need to take those mental breaks. And so, you know, setting a timer, being 
committed to that timer and saying, okay, for this amount of time, I'm going to focus on this. I know I, I don't want to stop studying this topic, but I need to for the ability to um, that mental exercise to be able to jump through topics because with our PT profession, it's not just one thing. Like you alluded to that, that the questions that you were taking, they're multi-level, they're multifactorial. There are a lot of things that are going into um, dealing with patients and patient populations. So we have to be flexible. And so if you're studying in that manner, then you're also able to um, produce when it's time to um, take your test. Yeah. To actually flex that muscle. So make sure you're, you're, make sure you're strengthening that particular muscle the right way so you can flex it. Um, everything you're saying, I'm, I'm sitting here nodding. I'm actually doing, I, I, I'll tip it off. Any colleague who's watching now, just, just pause this. But I do a great example where I have a pitcher of beer and a pint glass. And I say this, this right here, this is your cognitive ability. This is your cognitive load. This is all you can actually absorb in one sitting. And I don't care if you have a pitcher of beer and you keep pouring it, you're just going to eventually pour beer on the floor. So nobody wants to pour beer on the floor. We don't want to ever do that. All right. We don't want to make a mess. We don't want to throw the beer away, but realize if you're, if you're studying for five hours, it's akin to you just pouring into that same pint glass. Yeah. You got a pint. That's it. So maybe pour the pint full, sit, and maybe digest and say, okay, how long do I need to get this information down? Now I can return to that picture, which is still very full, and I can do a couple more ounces now. But Absolutely. I'm completely guilty of going, I'm just going to chug. I'm going to spend, it's an all night chug fest. I'm just going to try to get as much information in my head as possible. And meanwhile, on the floor, it's just a whole lot of beer. Did we just go information to beer analogy on this show? I think I think that's your jam, though. You do jam. it well. <laughs> but uh, but we're totally guilty of that. And, and, and especially, so this is what I want to ask you. In PT school, again, as a second career um, person coming to PT school, most of my classmates were 10 plus years younger than me. Um, and I still fell right in lockstep with them in terms of, oh my gosh, I got an 88 and you got a 95 and I spent eight hours studying for this test. I guess I need to spend 12 hours next time. Um, I was kind of, I kind of gave myself the nickname of Marty McFly because I could study for 10 hours or four hours and I'd always get an 88 akin to the DeLorean, the speed that it would need to, uh, to get to, to go back into the future. Um, no matter what I did, I always got an 88 and I had professors saying it's, it's passing. And eventually it's not going to matter. But how do you talk pay, uh, students off that? I felt like a ledge to me of caring about the 88 versus the 93. Like, teach me because I still don't know. I think that's a process. <sighs> um, you know, we don't like the we don't want to not be doing I know. the best. I know. You know, but sometimes your best is good enough. And then, you know, if you take a step back and assess what's important to you, because one, are you using effective study strategies that, okay. you know, in itself could actually make the difference. But then two, what difference in your quality of life is there if you study for 10 hours versus if you effectively study for five? And then where, in, in incorporating you, sleep uh, into this, this equation, you know? Yeah. I mean, I had classmates who'd wake up at five in the morning to study the morning of the test. My brain did not fun. I I'd rather study till two in the morning than get up at five. I was like, my brain ain't doing anything at five in the morning productive. Uh, but where were you in 2015 uh, when I needed that halfway through PT school? What's your undergraduate degree in? Because you're like super curious about this aspect of, of teaching. But I, I got it. Like, what's your undergrad degree in? So my undergraduate degree was in sports medicine. And initially I was going into athletic training and just made a curve through that process and yeah. landed I'm, in physical therapy. I like how you're like a uh, curve. That's not that much of a curve. I was a, I was a broadcasting major, Mika. I was a journalism yeah. major. That's not even a curve. <laughs> That's more than a, was a, a little bend. More than a 90 degree angle to get in there. Um, some people chiming in here. Lori saying, yes, yeah, some of her students who get an 88 are going to be better PTs than get the 95. Did they continue to learn from the 88? Great point, Lori. Back it up. My Marty McFly 88 on pretty much every test, no matter how hard I studied. Um, but there's other factors as you're talking, like sleep or or uh, or other things that can come into it, and strategies as you as you mentioned at the top of the show. Um, and again, you have to ask, what is the test actually testing, right? And where am I going to continue to learn? Because some people getting a, a 99 on the test are like, well, I'm done because I'm I'm almost perfect. Why do I? Need 
and you get someone like me who's like, I am clearly not perfect. We got to keep hustling uh, on this game. Um, you know, uh, so when you hear these things from uh, from students, I'm sure you you get these a lot in terms of, of relatable activities. Um, is there something that you have a go to in terms of how to talk them off that ledge um, when they when they start to bring these to you? I mean, just trying to restate, you know, what I know that we can change, you know, and, and ultimately it's the individual's decision on how they will proceed with that information. And so I think the, you know, what Lori brought up was with that 88, if you're still not fulfilled with that grade, you're, you're more likely to say, let me figure out why oh, I got this 88. Like, I want to know what I got wrong because I don't like, I don't want to keep making these mistakes. And so I think, you know, that hunger for figuring out why I got the questions wrong, not in, not to argue or, um, be in a, a way where you're just like, I, I know that was right. It's just, no, like really look at what did you get wrong and why? And that's part of that metacognition as part of studying. And so if you can do that before the test, then you're better off. But if even in the test and you got in your anxiety or in your emotions or whatever, you just didn't read the question well, you know, some of that is part of it too. What are your test taking strategies? Uh -huh. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, and so just really, having that moment of reflection is important. Yeah. I was really good at narrowing it down to two. And then I was very good at talking myself out of the right answer. Um, I would probably, I mean, if I would give any advice and uh, do you remember Boz Lerman, the song, everybody's free to wear sunscreen. It was <laughs> a spoken word. I'll pl I, look it up. Boz Lerman is like a movie okay. director, but he did this spoken word and it became a pop song. And I feel like I'm giving advice to people, which is um, like, I felt like I was so good at talking myself out of the right answer. And the reason was I tried to outthink the professor. Meanwhile, the professor is literally just trying to say, I'm just questioning you. I'm not trying to trick you. Like right. I think you know, that right. phrase probably would have helped me get 10 extra you know, points, which is I'm not trying to, to trick you. I'm trying to test you. So don't, don't double red herring the thing that you're trying to figure out. Just answer the question being given. But I was pretty good at, at talking myself out of the right answer. I don't know yeah. why. I think that's definitely true for us test taker, you know, just in general, hearing your professor say something, it's not always received. Just like when your parents tell you things, you hear it different from your cool cousin or your, you know, your cool <laughs> aunt or uncle. Right. And so I had some dialogue with some PT professor friends and it was, can you come and tell our students these things? Because we've been saying these things, but it, it comes, it, it hits different when somebody else says oh, yeah. the same thing. 100%. And so just to encourage students and say, like, you have the capacity to learn this, you can do this. And if you make a mistake, a mistake is going to happen. You are the rare occasion that somebody gets 100 on everything. And that's OK, because if you can reflect back on what it is you're learning, what you missed and why you missed it, it makes you better because we don't want to be wrong. You know, we don't want to skate through this and be like, oh, I barely got through PT school like you you put the effort and you put that work into saying, okay, well, why did I get that wrong? Yeah. What is it about that topic or that concept that is difficult for me? And that's when maybe you go to your professor and say, okay, can you help me with this concept? This is how I've learned it. This is what I can recall. This is how I would explain it. And then you can, they can help you and guide you on that path too. So reaching out to your professors early is definitely something that I encourage my students. Like as soon as you identify that there's an issue, sooner than later is so much better than waiting uh, because that's that other illusion of, oh, it'll get better because we're optimists, right? I'm an optimist. Sure. It'll get better. There's some things we definitely need to address yeah. as soon as possible. First semester, no, it was, uh, first year PT school, as you're saying this, I'm like, shoot, where were you? Um, it was active and passive insufficiency. Everybody in the room was like, yeah, I get it. I was like, yeah, I get it too. And then I would get every question wrong and I'm like, I actually don't understand this at all. And then it took one person just being like, here, here's what it does. I'm like, that's it? Like, I literally thought it was this, such this concept, like out of the room. And I was like, yeah, I totally get it. I don't need any help. But I would get every question wrong. Like, my professor was like, so you got every active impact. I was like, but I understand it. She's like, 
okay, explain it to me. Just as you said, like see one, do one, teach one. She's like, teach it to me. I'm like, I don't know it. And five minutes, five minutes later, probably three minutes later, I was like, that's it. And she's like, yeah, I was like, well, that was 15 points in the test. So that's why Jimmy keeps getting 88s because he, there was one giant thing. I wasn't bold enough to say, yeah, I'll be honest. I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you please teach me this? So I don't lose 15 points on a test. Um, See, yes. But doing that is, is huge. That, I mean, that's a lot of psychology, which is being uncomfortable, comfortable enough to say, yeah, I think I belong here, but I'm still not getting this. And if, can you spend five minutes on this for me? And I will, I'll work on it. I don't need you to give me the answer, but if you can lead me to the, how I can figure the answer out, super comfortable. Um, you use the phrase growth mindset a couple times. It's, it's kind of a buzz phrase. I like growth and mindset. What does growth mindset mean to you though? It means the capacity to continue to learn, you know, it, and so sometimes it's like, well, what is it? What is it not? It's not a fixed mindset. And a fixed mindset is I am smart and I don't have to work for it. And I know all the things already. Or a fixed mindset is I'm not as smart as everybody else around me. And I'm never going to be as smart as them. And so what barriers do you already set yourself set yourself up for? Sure. Um, if you're in that in that moment of. I don't know, you know, if it's imposter syndrome or if it's just really how you feel. Like there are just some people that are smarter than me. There are some people that might be smarter than me now, but as soon as I get that knowledge, then I will be just as smart as them, you know. And some of that comes from your dedication to the work and the information and your ability to um, that self reflection or that reflection of the knowledge. I feel like, like, I mean, I like growth mindset. We had Kadeem Howell on last week and he's, everything's growth. He's, he's like trading stocks and flipping cars and houses in his spare time. And I'm like, nice. <laughs> but I hear, like, I feel like growth mindset is people like Gary V. They're talking about it all the time on Twitter and, and Instagram. I feel like we should adopt like dynamic or static mindset. Like to me, like a dynamic mindset, because I've heard growth mindset. And I'm like, I know what that means. But I'm so like, tell, tell me about it, Jamie. Now I do, because me, I would just say, what does growth mindset mean to me? The way you just described it, I like it better. It's like dynamic mindset. Like I'm, I'm okay with saying, not that great right now, but you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to be one percent better, and seven days from now I'm going to be ten percent better, and three years from now, like I'm going to be onto some other different things. I think growth, and I mean, in terms of PT, like growth. Um, and dynamic, right? Is that is that word where it's like it's moving, it's always going forward. So Absolutely. I like I like how you phrase that. Thank you, uh, Mark Milligan. We 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 before we uh, hit record on this, we were talking. Mark Milligan. We just did a live show with him, and he. Uh, your ears must have been burning before we started speaking. <laughs> um, so so talk to me about some of the things, some of the conversations you got into at uh, in Denver last. Oh my God, I almost said last year, which is it was like five months ago, but feels like three years ago. That was actually February of 2020. Um, so uh, a presentation that uh, that Mark had done, we had talked about that a little bit. He said there was a lot of conversations going on over multiple days, and you he mentioned you several times. Why? Uh, wh what did you get into, and why did you why did you feel like this was something important enough at that time? Again, five months ago, but feels like ten years ago. Um, why was it important enough to talk about? At CSM, I was able to present with a group that uh, a com it was a task force, a work group within pedi pediatrics. So with the Academy of Pediatric Physical Therapy, I was on a diversity, equity and inclusion work group to look at um, any types of suggestions or um, recommendations that could be made to make our profession, our specialty more diverse and welcoming to include more people that may feel um, not a part of of the community. And so we decided to talk about hot topics and diversity, equity, and inclusion for pediatric physical therapists and assistants. My topic was microaggressions. And <clears throat> at the time, you know, now with all the different things going on in society, it's just like, wow, we were definitely on the pulse of what needed to be addressed. And, you know, it was well received, well um, represented where people you know, came to a lot of the DEI sessions that I even attended as a participant, but um, just really understanding how, and I know Mark talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why it's important to make these efforts is because you want the profession to reflect what society looks like. 
And so that is in representation of gender, age, sex, uh, you know, gender expression and sexual orientation, like all of those things, like we have to be in a space where we are comfortable with people that are different than us. And that makes our profession better. It makes our skill set better. Um, and then talking about microaggressions, it's maybe these are the reasons why people um, don't want to be in the spaces that they're that we're trying to welcome them in because we don't, you know, we're not feeling welcome. If you've ever been marginalized or the only one of a particular category in a group, um, it's not fun. And it's not fun, especially if somebody is snubbing you or just intentionally or not intentionally just not including you. Um, so it could be a variety of things that are um, being expressed. So in addition to microaggressions, just looking at how do we make the change? So it's not a, it's not good to just point the thing out. It's like, so now what do we do with that? Or knowledge? Do that, right. Yeah. Yeah. And what, so, what now what? Right. And so then I talked about micro affirmations and how you can include and you can um, encourage and you give credit to the people that are around you doing great things, especially if they're of a marginalized group, because you don't want their work and effort to not be re re recognized and you want them to continue to want to be um, willing participants in the conversations and the spaces that um, professionally or personally that they occupy. Yeah. We, uh, one of our producers actually shared a, a great infographic based on information from the APTA, which is, uh, which is the demographic and, and the representation of therapists in the profession and looking at some of the data because there are, you know, collecting data takes a long time, like a census, but from, from, uh, two, two censuses ago to the last one, we've actually regressed, which which should anger, you know, it's like we, we learned what, you know, we, we researched, we collected data twice. And in the time from A to B, we actually regressed to now. And I guess the question is like, and I'm glad we're having these questions. I'm glad we lined up Mark and you in the same day, just so Mark could be a great opening band for you. Like you can tell Mark that be like, Hey, thanks for being my opening act. Um, that we're having these conversations, and I call him kind of a CSM Nostradamus because he he was involved in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was ongoing. It wasn't just him, uh, but also telehealth, which is two topics which have taken the forefront. But you mentioned microaggressions. I had no idea what that term was. I'm 40 years old. I grew up in a white suburb of New York. Like I know it. Like uh, the the most my, the most um, microaggression I would have uh, ever felt is uh, you know I was I was the short guy in the baseball team. That's about it. Um, but Mark mentioned like, you know, examples of not having the proper pronouns on intake forms in PT clinics. We need to think about that because Absolutely. if you're looking for that and you don't see that, you actually see yourself excluded because there are things that do not allow, not even an other, a chance for you to write that in, but that's not even enough. We want you to be included. You want to say, we, we've, we, we, we are welcoming you. You need to be on the form. That's this big, but that's, that's a. That's a, a huge example of we're not prepared for that. We're not having enough discussions, or I should say, we weren't having enough discussions. I hope we, all, I hope we will continue to have more discussions about this in the future. And the effort speaks volumes. Um, I think part of the process is we're not going to get everything right. You know, it kind of goes back to studying and learning. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get it all right now. But we need to be open for the conversation, for difficult conversations. It might be awkward and uncomfortable, but if we don't have them, then we're Never. in that regressive state of that we're not even going to acknowledge it, that there is really something that could be worked on, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, everything I said, we, we've had several people on. We had some students, or sorry, I don't want to call them students, new graduates now, because they were students when they wrote their uh, their paper um, from Texas State, looking at mm -hmm. the experiences of black physical therapists, uh, physical therapy students in, in, uh, in Texas. Um, and I didn't, I think we were off the air when I said this and I was like, don't take your foot off the gas now. Like you did this before it was the trendy topic. And I say the trendy topic, not the important topic. You were mm -hmm. having a conversation before everybody was like, oh, okay, let's, we, we need to have this conversation. Don't take your foot off the gas. Like this needs to be at CSM in every section, right? It can't just be in peds or ortho or sport. Like it needs to be like, what are we doing? How, how are we having this conversation in mm -hmm. all of these different areas and these different sections of physical therapy? Otherwise, the next time we do a census, 
it might be worse. It might be worse. Even though mm-hmm. we're having a conversation, once we're doing something about it, it might be worse. We can't have that. That's true. Absolutely. Um, man, we're getting a lot of comments. Cookies, very, very important. Yeah. <laughs> She's coming in. Love cookie. <laughs> um, are you ready for three questions? Did you prepare? I, for this I, test? I'm ready. I'm, no never I was born ready. You I'm a New Yorker, right? All right, let's do three questions uh, right now. Let's do that one. All right, three questions brought to you by our friends at Arius Medical Staffing. Uh, check them out at aureusmedical.com. If you're looking to do what you want to do, which is be a great physical therapist or physical therapist assistant anywhere in the U.S., right? 50, uh, 50 states. I tell people all the time, I'm pointing at it, but you can't see it. It's my license. Your PT license is your license to be a PT. Um, so do that where you want to do it in terms of location geographically and setting patient population. Uh, see what's out there right now at aureusmedical.com. Go there. Just take a look. aureusmedical.com. So the first question uh, from New York, but uh, now you're down in North Carolina. But if you had carte blanche, you can go any, anywhere in the, in the country that you want to go for three months. Where would you go? I would go to New York. <laughs> where? Where in New York would you go? So for three months, I feel like I could span the entire state because yeah. growing up in the city, it, you know, I didn't see as much of, you know, I would get to Albany, but I would love to see Niagara Falls and just, yeah. you know, just see it more in a, a slower pace and not, and be a tourist, you know? And, yeah. Well, that's the thing. And I'm, you know, explore I'm, the city. Yeah. I'm a lifelong, I mean, I'm a New Yorker. I shouldn't say lifelong. I moved around, but like a lot of people here in New York and they're just like, yeah, you know, New York, it's Manhattan. And I'm like, uh, most of New York state is actually a state park. I don't know if people know that like, Adirondack state park is like as big as like Rhode Island. Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty diverse, I mean, we border Canada. Like, do people know that? Like New York borders Canada. It's, we got a great Lake in the state. So, uh, New York state, Good answer. I like that. Second question is the what question. What's something you've watched, read, listened to, like movie, book, podcast, something that you think the audience uh, could could take away and, uh, and 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 get some information out of? Just one thing? You can get two. I'm not going to okay. limit you. So recently, I just and read, listened to, because audiobooks are my new Love thing. Audio. And Deep Work is a book that I just listened to. And it just really talked about how you can take pretty much all of these study things and strategies to the next level and in preparation for just putting focused attention into the things that you're doing to be more effective with your time and yeah. not allowing distractions to allow make things take longer in your life. Um, and so I'm probably going to have to listen to it a couple more times to really uh, digest what was in there. But there were a lot of moments where I was like, wow. I definitely want to, I want to do more things. I want to do different things and I want to be respectful of time and, and this might be a tool. Yeah. Deep work. I like that. Do you want to know my, my strategy the every day? I actually wrote an entire simpo, like I'm going to be talking to Lynchburg university on tomorrow, tomorrow, Friday, Friday. <laughs> um, I wrote the entire thing because I went to a park to, uh, to just kind of like, type. there was no Wi-Fi. Mika, you know what it was like to have no Wi-Fi? It was blissful. That's part of the no distraction, right? Fantastic. And part of what they talk about in that book is just nature and how nature can stimulate you to be more creative. So you had a double whammy right there. There were trees, there were birds, there was grass, there were some people playing basketball. I was just kind of like, oh, that's kind of cool. And I'm writing a little bit. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I couldn't Google anything. It was amazing. Uh, we always yeah. like to start and end with people. Third question on three questions is a who question. Who's someone the audience should know more about? So I believe her ears are already burning today. So I'm going to say Lisa Van Hoos. Um, she is an amazing human being. I have, there are some students that are on Twitter. So Twitter is where I live for, you know, my social media spot and, uh, you know, just people that I follow there. There's Deja Smallwood, there's Drew Anderson, there is um, Chelsea Lasky, there is Becky Bliss that you know. I think anybody that is a professor at Methodist University is fantastic. Um, And so those are the people that I would shout out and um, say that they're working, doing amazing things. Got to bring Lisa. Lisa's been mentioned like five (laughs) times. I actually sat next to her at a presentation at Education and Leadership Conference in Seattle, Seattle. And my professor was actually in between, sorry, she, my professor was in between her and she was gone. My professor Scott was nudging me and she's like, 
you got you have to interview her. I'm like, who is that? She's like, that's Lisa Van Hoos. Oh, that's Lisa Van Hoos. So she's like, you got to interview her. So we'll get her on the show. She's like yes. my whale right now. Is like I was like I need I need to bring her in. So uh, so we'll bring her in. All right, that's three questions from Arius uh, Medical A U R E U S Medical. Dot com. Let's do your parting shot. Are you ready for this? I think you never prepare for your parting shot. Let's do your parting shot right now. Look how fancy we are with the grat like that, like a spinning cube. I have no idea how we even make that thing. Uh, parting shot. Is brought to you by the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy, orthopt.org. Tomorrow, we're talking to Chris Hughes on the show about um, tissue tolerance. They have a tissue tolerance course and a running course because I feel like everybody and their mom, including my mom, is like running now <laughs> or biking. Like those two things. Like, hey, let's grab onto this. Like everybody's biking and running and doing stuff. Like let's not make it like six months from now. Everybody's just hurt and not doing it. So uh, the Academy of Orthopedic PT has several courses. We're going to give you a chance to win your choice. Just like you win one, you pick one. Uh, check out what they have to offer at orthopt.org. We're talking to Chris Hughes tomorrow. So your parting shot, Mika. All right. Well, I want to thank you for this opportunity and for all the everyone listening, you know, have a growth mindset. And I think setting your goals are important because if you set your goals not just something that you really think is attainable. Set your goals for something beyond your wildest expectation, and you'll be surprised where you land. Love that. Short, sweet, to the point. Who knows? I mean, what do they say? Like, uh, aim for the s- stars, and if you miss, you hit, miss, you hit the moon. I don't know. Some, somebody said it way better I than think me. It, aim for the moon. Aim but, for the yeah. moon. I, you're right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but I feel like that's you know kind of what I'm doing now. I would have never imagined to be in these spaces to have these conversations, but here we are. Here we are. Let's keep going. Uh, would love to have you back soon. We could talk more Pete's PT because uh, I feel like we should do an entire episode on just obstacle courses. Because if you don't like obstacle <laughs> that's everybody's courses, favorite. <laughs> if you don't like obstacle courses, I don't want to know you. Like the floor is in fact lava, which the is floor is lava on TV yes, on that? Netflix. Yeah. How insane is that? Like this is the thing we've been talking about. I Can wanted you? to know, but is the floor really lava? I know. Well, there's one. Let's, We'll get the volcanologist. It's red water. water. (laughs) Spoiler is red water. (laughs) The lawyers would have a field day with that. Uh, Mika, it's been a pleasure. We'll have you back soon. And uh, thanks for sharing some insight on a a really great topics. All right. Thank you.